um, and my dad's always a good stand-in. He's an avid Civil War buff, and um, is constantly reading about Civil War stuff, and is a, a reenactor. So um, he's going to talk to us about the Tiger Rifles from New Orleans, and uh, is that how LSU got their name? Is that the group? Yeah. So he'll fill you in on all that. When the Civil War got started, the uh, call for troops uh, went out in uh, 1881, 61, and they, and they started forming troops all over the all over Louisiana, all over the South. Louisiana particularly formed a bunch of them. We, we had eight units right here in St. Landry Parish formed. Of course, remember St. Landry Parish was advancing St. Landry and Acadia, but we had eight units from from St. Landry that we had Tiger Rifles. Now these group, this group was a strange group to begin with. Uh, they were misfits. They were dregs of society. They all worked primarily along the waterfront. They never had a penny in their pocket at any time unless they stole it from somebody. They were avid card players. Uh, they liked to fight. That's all they did was drink, fight, play cards, and work. And they formed in there with a group under a man by the name of Robusto Wheat. Now, Colonel Wheat was a uh, fellow from Kentucky who tried to make a living as a, as a uh, businessman, never seemed to quite make it as a businessman, ended up being a soldier of fortune. And at the time, in the early 1800s, you had a lot of activity going on around. He was fighting in Cuba, Nicaragua. He fought the, the uh, Pope in, in Italy. He fought in Spain. He was a soldier of fortune. Uh, he put, uh, announced that he was putting together a unit, and he went down to the waterfront and got his old buddies. Now, many of these people that were in this unit fought with him in different wars throughout the uh, uh, Central and South America. So he knew them, they knew him, and they were ready to fight with him. Uh, like I said, they were a group of people who did nothing but fight, drink, play cards, and cause trouble. Although when it came to fighting as a military unit, they were very loyal, they were very honorable, they followed orders, and they were probably some of the best fighters you'll ever see. So what happened was that they, after they got started, a rich businessman in New Orleans, and I don't know whether he's a Richard or a Richard, but he put together their uniforms. And their uniforms were a little bit different than what you think of as a Confederate uniform. They were based on the Zouave uniform. We have a picture of it right up here in the front if you see. They look similar to what you see in a uh, on a mattress cover made out of the same material. Uh, their stockings were stripes in the other direction. They were green and white. And they had leggings. Now this group here, this is how they dressed and they would parade up and down uh, New Orleans in these things. Uh, uniforms in those days, no matter what group you were in, you got one if you were lucky. The captain of the group uh, knew what he had, he knew what he wanted, and he went out and recruited all these fellows. Now they went, to, went and formed in New Orleans and they went to Camp Walker. Camp Walker was located right where the Metairie Cemetery is. When you turn to go into New Orleans on Interstate 10, that cemetery was Camp Walker. It was also the racetrack. It's lasted there a couple of months until they found out that most people were there were dying, dying of disease caused by the bad water in the swamp and the mosquitoes. So they moved from there up to Tangipaho, the town of Tangipaho, to what they call Camp Moore, which was the recruiting ground and a training ground for all of the troops that, that were in Louisiana. There were actually 25,000 Louisiana boys that went through Camp Moore in a two-year period. Uh, on the way there, one of the fellows was cutting up so much he fell off the train and got run over by the train. And uh, they were told never to take the train again because nobody wanted them back in their town. And after that, any Louisiana unit that went through on that train track 
was recorded as trash and we don't want you. They were issued what they call the Mississippi rifle. The Mississippi rifle was a, was uh, used in the Spanish in the uh, <clears throat> Mexican War, and it was called that because it was named after Jeff Davis and the Mississippi uh, units that used it. One of the features of this thing was it had no attachment to a bayonet. The most rifles at that time, the muskets at that time, there was a special piece on the front that you would put a bayonet on and it would lock it in position. These didn't have it. So they were at a disadvantage that they didn't have it. But they were issued Bowie knives. Now Bowie knife, we all see these little Bowie knives you see in the magazines and stuff. Their Bowie knife was at least 15 to 22 inches long. It was heavy, it was probably anywhere from uh, 3 16 to a quarter inch thick. They had different varieties of them. They were big, heavy knives. A lot of them were homemade. In fact, most of them are homemade. The, uh, some of the early, the, some of the ones you find in museums, you can still see the file that they were made out of because they were made out of files. And that was a good steel to make these blades out of. But when they got to Manassas, they decided that they wanted to be one of the first group to fight. Well, they ended up being one of the first groups. They fought in a skirmish. And they were called back to the back lines. And, and then later on, when the actual Battle of Manassas got started, they were again put on the front line and they were pushed back and forth during the battle. It got to one point where the commander, who was a PGT Beauregard, who was from Louisiana, said, I need somebody to take a hill because there's artillery on that hill. And the artillery is backed up by the New York Zouaves, which would be the same uniform except all in red and blue. Well, as they approached the battlefield for the main battle, the South Carolina group saw the blue coats in line ready to attack and they fired on them. Problem was they were the Tiger Rifles with the blue coats. This also happened at Shiloh with the group from Louisiana, the 18th Battalion from Louisiana was fired on because they also had blue coats. Well, Wheat, as strong as he was, was able to control them and take them under control, calm them down and say, look, the enemy's over there, not behind you. So they got ready to fight. And again, there was this hill. So they got within about 300 feet of the hill in a covered area with a lot of trees. And there was an open area going up the hill. Well. The uh, New York Zouaves gave a big cheer and started charging down the hill to protect the battery of, 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 of cannons up on the top. Uh, as one reporter said, that, that was the last time they cheered. Uh, most of them were wiped out in that raid. Hey! Get him, Louisiana! Get him, Tom!